Thank you so much for the invitation today. And um, I'm mostly going to add a little bit to what Bandari sir already discussed about meteorites and the early solar system. All right, here. Yeah. Impacts are very common phenomena in the entire solar system, not just on Earth. Here is an example of such an impact crater. It's a meteor crater in Arizona. It's about two kilometers in diameter and also 50 to 60,000 years old, um, giant hole in the crater, uh, in the, on the ground. Another example of such impacts, planetary impacts, is the um, impact of uh, comet Shoemaker-Levy that happened on Jupiter in 1996. And it was observed all over the world with all the telescopes. And here is a very spectacular image of, the, of the, this comet burning into Jupiter's atmosphere. So these impacts are very common and they happen all the time on Earth and other planets. So my personal experience with such planetary impacts was in 2016, 2016, when I was a graduate student in Arizona. Uh, on 2nd June, 2016, there was a giant, well, not really giant, but a meteorite impact and a fireball that was observed. Here is a picture that local media produced that they left, the, the meteorite left a trail in the sky, in the early sky, early morning sky. Um, these days, the technology is so advanced that you can look at the weather radar and um, predict where this meteorite fell. So um, with these sophisticated models of meteorite fall, we, they predicted that this fell somewhere about 82 miles from Tempe. So 82 miles is where Arizona State University is, and that's where I was studying at the time. So this was actually middle of nowhere. It fell on the Indian, I mean, um, Native American uh, land. So the laws in the US are such that if it falls on a private property, it belongs to the landowner. Since this is a Native American land, it belonged to the Native, um, uh, Native people of uh, Arizona. This is a specific tribe called Apache, uh, White Mountain Apache tribe. We, a, being at ASU, got like special permission to go hunt for it. The closest town or civilization was this town called Sibiku, which is about 15 miles uh, from this uh, region. And um, in, look, in, in the Apache language, it's called this Shivako. So this was the team of people who actually um, happened to be on, um, on, the, on the ground, like six of us. I was a graduate student. That's our um, collection manager, research scientist, scientist at ASU, Dr. Uh, Lawrence Garvey, and another grad student. And we had three private meteorite hunters who were with us searching these grounds for about four days of, on a long, long weekend. And we did find meteorites. So here is a picture of how the ground look like. And there are some meteorites here. So I have a question to the audience. Can you locate, identify, if you see anything unusual, like an unusual yeah. rock in here? Does anyone want to take a guess? Yeah. Where okay. do you see it? Just give me a random orientation, like random clue. It's on the near top left corner. Over here? Yeah. Can you see my, my cursor? Yes, yes, that one. Okay. Well, unfortunately, that is not a meteorite. This is a meteorite. It's really tiny. So I know, like, you know, all the Hollywood movies that you may have seen where you have these giant meteorite imp impacts. But most of the meteorites that come onto the Earth are actually really, really tiny. So there are actually three pieces here. There is that one, and there are two more. Like Bhandari sir uh, were, was explaining, they come into the atmosphere and impact the Earth with a lot of velocity. So what we found here was like a tiny crater, a tiny like pit in the ground, and the rock fell, impacted, and broke into three pieces. So they're really tiny, maybe like a peanut size, we totally recovered about 16 stones in those four days. And the largest one was like a big, like strawberry size. Most of them were pretty small. And one of the things that Bandari sir was explaining is that the outer region or the outer layer of this meteorite is very charred or burnt, which is called the fusion crust. And here you can see that very distinctly, they're very dark, but the interior is actually very light in color. So that's a distinguishing feature um, of like identifying a meteorite. So meteorites are named after the places where they form. Uh, they, they are, they're, they're found or they fall. So this was uh, the fourth observed fall in Arizona in human history. Uh, so we collected this. These are the um, 
rocks that we collected there. And the meteorite was named as Ishtubiko Star Stone, which was the native uh, name in the native language for the Sibiku uh, town, which is about 15 miles uh, from this uh, region. Another really exciting um, meteorite fall occurred actually just a few months ago in Mississippi, Natchez. I don't know if you heard about it on the media. This was, I think, 27th of April, so just a couple of months ago. And I also had an opportunity to go hunt for this meteorite. Now, this is a much larger um, fall. Actually, I don't know if the, a, the Arizona one wasn't, was large or not. Since it was on the uh, native land, there were not many people to go you know, hunt for it because they didn't have the permission. But here, a lot of private meteorite hunters and local uh, people found lots of stones. Uh, and we found a, a few stones too. So this was a, uh, like a joint expedition between NASA Johnson Space Center and LPI where I work. And we have this um, rapid response team uh, where we are um, hoping to go collect meteorites as they fall. So here is a stone from Natchez and it's actually called Cranfield. It's, it is uh, just approved by the Meteoritical Bull, uh, Bulletin, uh, Meteoritical Society and the name has just been approved for it. So, Meteorites fall on the earth all the time. Most of the meteorites that we look at or we analyze and we study come from very much into the inner solar system. So here is an artist's depiction of what the early solar system looked like. What you have is the proto-sun or the baby sun at the center. And this is surrounded by a giant disk of gas and dust that is basically rotating around this baby sun. And most of the meteorites that form at a very early stage when you don't have all the terrestrial planets like Earth, Mars, and Venus, and they, they form very close to the sun compared to the rest of the solar system. Um, they are classified basically into three types. First is the chondritic meteorites or the stony meteorites. As Bandari sir was explaining, these are basically aggregates of dust, like little dust bunnies that come together and they don't grow large enough for them to melt or they grow a little bit later uh, in time that they don't have enough uh, radioactivity or accretionary heat to melt. So they just exist as like sedimentary rocks. That would be a good comparison. So they have not undergone any melting. These are called chondritic stony meteorites. The other type of stony meteorites are called achondritic stony meteorites. So here is an example of that. Now, when things come together and form a larger and larger planetary embryo or baby planet, uh, some of the accretionary heat and the radioactive heat might cause it to melt. And when such melting occurs, there is a process called differentiation, very much similar to what we find on Earth, where you have the core, which is very um, rich in nickel and iron uh, metal. So it's basically all the heavy metal sinks into the core and all the lighter silicate material remains in the mantle and the crust. So the achondritic stony meteorites come from this uh, stony crust or the mantle, which are mostly made up of basalt. It's a very common terrestrial rock. In fact, Mumbai and a lot of uh, surrounding areas made up of Deccan flood basalts. So many of these meteorites are not very different than what, what the local rock is in Mumbai. Um, as these planetesimals break up, sometimes the core is exposed and this core is made up of pure like iron and nickel and maybe some other uh, elements. And these are called the iron meteorites. So that's another type of meteorites. This is very heavy, not much porosity. And um, uh, they're basically very heavy and magnetic in nature. Now, somewhere between the boundary of this like silicate crust and um, uh, the iron and metal rich core, you will find a mixture of both these phases. So that's where these very special meteorites called palisites come from. Here you can see the green material is a very common mineral called olivine, which is a magnesium silicate. So that's the silicate part and it's also surrounded by iron and nickel metal. So they are, they're coming from all different stages are breaking up of this uh, planet, uh, planetary, planetesimal actually. So these are the type of meteorites that have been discovered and uh, we analyze them on Earth. As Bandari sir was saying, most of them come from uh, the asteroidal belt, which is between Jupiter and Mars. However, there are about 250 maybe meteorites that have been discovered that, that originate from the moon and about the same number that are Martian in their nature. So the samples that we have in our collection that we can analyze are called uh, astro materials. So lots of meteorites, but other than that, we have also been onto the moon with like all these uh, 
missions like Apollo mission and Luna mission and missions and have collected rocks from there. So we have moon rocks in our collection that tell us that are extraterrestrial materials. We also have a comet by the Stardust mission. It went to a comet called Will2 and collected a bunch of these really tiny particles, which are mostly uh, non-volatile in nature. From our own sun that were collected by the genesis samples that were implanted onto these um, uh, the collector material. Um, another important astro material is called interplanetary dust particles. Now these keep falling, lots of lots of dust keeps falling onto the earth. A special kind of these interplanetary dust particles are called chondritic porous IDPs, which, uh, which are believed to have come from different comets that cross Earth's uh, orbit. So we have some of those materials. However, we don't really know much about the parent body of, or where the, the, or the source of these uh, materials. And then we also have micrometeorites. So these are a variety of different samples that we can analyze in the lab about the early solar system. Next, I study materials. The two tools that I really like to use is called an MCICPMS, which is a multi-collector inductor. It has a giant magnet. So this is the one that is like a new um, Okay. Um, instrument that is currently being installed in as your uh, different isotopes based on their mass to charge ratio. And you can um, simultaneously collect them at the detectors and uh, calculate the abundances of different isotopic species. Now this uh, instrument, the MCICPMS is special because you can actually detect isotopic variations to like parts per billion. Uh, so really, really precise. For that, in order to do that, you have to take a rock, dissolve it completely in all these acids, and then separate it out like the element of interest with column chemistry or ion exchange column chemistry. So you purify that element and then analyze it. So it actually gets rid of all the interferences and all the other things that could affect the signal. So in this process, you're actually losing out on the spatial context of what exactly it is that you're measuring. The other kind of mass spectrometer is called a SIMS or a nanosims in this case, which is a secondary ion mass spectrometer. Here you just take a slab of a, a meteorite and you bombard it with an ion beam. The spatial resolution that this allows, this kind of instrumentation allows is few hundred nanometers. So it's like really, really uh, high spatial resolution. However, you kind of lose out on the isotopic precision. So they are kind of complementary techniques to each other. Uh, these are the two techniques that I use for my research. However, to analyze these meteorites and astro materials, there are a variety of techniques that you can use uh, um, and know their mineralogy, chemistry, uh, elemental abundances, isotopic abundances, etc. So for this talk, I decided that instead of uh, just talking about my research, I wanted to focus on some major discoveries in cosmochemistry um, that have allowed us to understand how our Earth and the solar system formed uh, that came from these meteorites, the analysis of these meteorites. And one of my favorite uh, discovery is the age of the Earth. So as you know, Earth is a very dynamic planet. There is a lot of like resurfacing, reprocessing of things that, that keeps happening on the Earth. So the oldest rocks or actually oldest minerals called zircons that you find on Earth are maybe about 4 billion years old. But there is no actual rock that formed at the beginning, like when the lab and date. So that's really unfortunate. It's good that the planet is very active and can sustain um, life and different uh, and all the organisms that we see, but it's not really good to, to know like you know, how old the earth is. But the answer for this question comes from meteorites. Specifically, iron meteorites, actually one of the iron meteorites that was Canyon Diablo, which was responsible for the impact crater in Arizona, the meteor crater that I showed earlier. So all of, many of these ion meteorites, uh, they can be dated using um, lead lead or uranium lead isotopic system. This is a long lived system. Uranium has like multiple decay chains and it um, decays to two different uh, isotopes of lead. And when you combine these that can tell you very precisely when the earth formed. So the oldest study of this is like was done in 1956 um, by Claire Patterson. There is a very beautiful episode of a series called Cosmos, where they talk about how difficult it was to get this um, analysis done because of the lead contamination. You know, in, in those times, 
uh, a lot of gas or petrol that you put in your car was le like loaded with doing that um it came up to the uh, this age of 4.5 billion years old now modern uh, my maybe improve that to a few more digits, but this is actually very accurate um, determination of age of Earth. So that was a major discovery that um, changed our understanding of how Earth and other planets formed. So if Earth is four and a half billion years old, how old is the solar system? So here is one of the famous meteorites that Bandari Sir was talking about, the Ainde meteorite that fell in 1969. Then it's a carbonaceous chondrite. So the name, Carbonaceous chondrite comes from, or chondrite actually comes from these um, tiny little like molten uh, rock fragments or the droplets of frozen rock, which are called chondrules. So these meteorites contain chondrules. They're primitive. They've not undergone any different significant differentiation or thermal processes. So they are basically sedimentary rock or sedimentary histories in the early solar system. Um, however, what I'm, I'm, my work focuses is on calcium aluminum rich inclusions. These are these refractory inclusions that form at very high temperatures, and they are the first formed solids in our solar system. They're about millimeter to centimeter in size. And they have been dated in using a variety of long lived and short lived radiometric techniques. The lead light technique dates these CAIs to be 4,567.3 million years with an error bar or analytical precision of 0.16 million years. Now, as a human being, it's sometimes really, really difficult to imagine what million years look like. So let's try and translate that to a human being. So just imagine that you have a person who's about 60 years old, and for some reason, they have lost their memory and birth certificate, and they don't know the time of their birth. Um, with the precision that we know the age of our solar system, that would be equivalent to knowing the time of birth of a person with the precision on an error bar of 18.4 hours. That's actually very precise. By the way, biology cannot do that for human beings. I think what you, the estimation of uh, some a living person's age comes from their dental records and that's about two to three years of uh, analytical precision. So we know the age of our solar system way more precisely than what we can say about a living human being. That thanks to these meteorites and these uh, components that are hosted in these meteorites. So the next major discovery is discovery of pre-solar materials. Now, like Bandari sir was talking about this earlier, pre-solar materials are materials that form in the other star, uh, star formation regions and they're delivered to our uh, early solar system. And then they're preserved into these meteorites that we can detect. So how can we actually tell that these are uh, pre-solar in nature is based on their isotopic composition. We had some hints of these materials, like they were predicted to uh, exist on some of these uh, meteorites um, by noble gas analysis. So um, in 1969, when they took some of these meteorites and heated them and measured their isotopic composition, at certain temperatures, you had this phase, which was like very mysterious, we didn't know what it was made of, release these isotop the, these gases with a very anomalous gas uh, composition, isotopic composition. Um, and this was our first hint of like, there may be some pre-solar material, extrasolar material that may be existing in the early solar system. However, uh, much later, the technology and the analytical capability has improved so much that we can actually find this stardust in different meteor different meteoritical, the primitive meteoritical materials. Most of these materials are very tiny, like a few microns to a few hundred nanometers in size. And many of them are very refractory, but you also have silicates and oxides uh, that are formed. So I want to give you an example of what isotopic uh, analysis or composition can do in this, this scenario. So you, here you see um, an oxygen isotopic uh, chart or a plot. Oxygen has three stable isotopes, 16, 17, and 18. So on y-axis, you have a ratio of 17 to 16 oxygen. And on x-axis, you have a ratio of 18 to 16 oxygen. And here, the dotted line that shows solar composition, the intersection of this is where all the, the solar system, the Earth, Moon, Mars, they all like fall in a very small region over there. Whereas 
All these pre-solar grains have oxygen isotopic composition that is orders of magnitude different than what you find in our solar system material. No physical or chemical process on Earth can actually fraction its isotopes to find these kind of materials. So they have to be from extrasolar, uh, pre-solar uh, material. So that is a very burning um, evidence that these materials come from outside of the solar system at the very beginning of the formation of our solar system since they have been preserved into these meteorites. A lot of them have been uh, hypothesized to be coming from supernova source. Now this is a um, very exciting discovery that what role a uh, supernova explosion played in our own solar system, formation of our own solar system. And very recently, actually 2016, there were some observations of uh, some supernovae that showed these rings. So this is an artist's depiction. It's not a real image, but this is what it would look like where you have these um, rings of materials that has been ejected from this uh, uh, central star, the supernova, um, into the uh, interstellar medium. And we actually find evidence of it on our own Earth so many of the ocean uh, bottoms contain these sedimentary deposits. They're called ferromagnesian nodules. They're made up of iron and mag uh, magnesium. And just like tree rings, they, have, they form very slowly. You have materials of iron and uh, magnesium-rich material that goes on depositing in these layers around them. And you can date these layers within these. And they form like over like a few million years. So some of these ferromagnesian nodules were dated and what they found is a light evidence of life 60 uh, ion. So 60 ion is a short-lived radionuclear nucleus, uh, nuclear, nuclear, radionucleus, which does not um, form by any other process other than formation in the supernova. There is no other physical chemical process that can produce uh, 60 ions. So it's like a smoking gun for a supernova explosion uh, in the surrounding regions. So on these sedimentary deposits that were found on the earth, we have a spike in 60 iron in about two and a half million years from today, so going back in time, and also somewhere around seven and a half million years. So this is a very um, actually uh, evident that a lot of extra stolar, stolar, stolar extra uh, stellar material was actually deposited and actually brought onto the earth in our, uh, in our own solar system in the recent times. Um, so the next great discovery in cosmochemistry is how do planets melt and what sort of uh, mechanisms can actually produce that kind of heat. Uh, a little bit of this Pandari Sir already discussed is some of them actually melt because they grow large enough and they have accretionary heat, but that's not really enough to melt them. So the discovery of this short-lived radionucleus, short-lived radionuclei, 26 aluminum, that's what that was discovered in many of these primitive materials. So 26 aluminum decays to 26 magnesium with a half-life of 0.7 million years. So whatever formed at the beginning of the solar system, within first five million years or something, most of it has been decayed. However, you when you correlate that with the actual um, aluminum to magnesium ratio, sometimes you find these correlations, which are called isochrons, that let you determine how old, uh, how much of the 26 aluminum was existing as these rocks or these chondritic components formed. The discovery of 26 aluminum is actually very important because it tells you that it was produced somewhere else in the other stellar systems and was brought to uh, the solar system at the very beginning. Secondly, it tells you that it can be a heat source for melting of many of the planetesimals. And thirdly, it can be a potential chronometer that could allow you to do relative dating of the early solar system events. So because of these short-lived radionuclides like 26 aluminum, 53 uh, manganese, we can define or we can find out the so processes that happen in the early solar system with a very high precision. So here, the first form uh, objects in the solar system are the CAIs or the calcium aluminum rich inclusions that define time zero, which is the beginning of the solar system. Because of these short-lived radionuclides, we have the and different components of these meteorites that can be dated using them, uh, we have a very precise chronology of the early solar system events. So a lot of these chondrules and CAIs that are centimeter to millimeter size objects that formed during the accretion, the early stages of accretion, actually goes up to first four million years of the solar system. But at the same time, you have major terrestrial planets like Mars or many of the parent bodies of 
differentiated meteorites like eucrites and angrites that were already forming, as well as Jupiter formation that has been indirectly dated that also happened in the early solar system. So because of the dating of all these primitive components and the meteoritic components, uh, what we can see is that the planet formation is not a linear process where you have these centimeter to millimeter sized particles coming together to form larger and larger bodies and that form eventually planets, but it is actually um, happening at different stages and different parts of our solar system simultaneously. So it's kind of a messy process where you have some regions in the solar system where you're still melting CAs and condors, where are other regions in the solar system when you're already accreting differentiated planets and giant planets like Jupiter. So these are the major discoveries that we can say about our own solar system based on dating of these meteorites. So this was when these planets formed. The next topic is how do these planets form or where do they form? So this is another oxygen isotopic plot. It's very similar to the one that I showed you earlier. However, here there is a delta notation. So delta notation is parts per 10,000, sorry, parts per thousand. Um, so it's actually very much reduced and that's where all the terrestrial planets form. So based on this triple oxygen isotopic plot, uh, plot you, uh, there are multiple, um, there are multiple regions in which, which these different meteorites fall and you can classify them and potentially identify where they are forming in the solar system. When you combine oxygen isotopic composition with an other uh, isotopic compositions like chromium isotopes, 54 chromium and other isotopic systems, and you analyze all these meteorites, they actually show two very distinct groups. The ones that are mostly like carbonaceous chondrites are called CC, or CC reservoir. And then you have the non-carbonaceous uh, reservoir where most of your terrestrial planets like Earth, Mars, and Moon, and some of the meteorite components like ordinary chondrites fall. So this is a distinct dichotomy that can be traced using isotopic compositions of these meteorites. What they suggest is there were two major reservoirs of materials that accreted material in the early, that accreted and formed different planets and planetesimals in the early solar system. But this is not just a uh, observation that is based uh, on the laboratory analysis, but you can actually extrapolate, uh, sorry, yes, extrapolate that into the early solar system and hypothesize what may have happened. So one of the ways to explain this isotopic dichotomy is formation of these materials very early, but also formation of giant planets like Jupiter very early. Now, when planets like Jupiter form, they open up these gaps in the planet protoplanetary disks, and they actually prohibit the transfer of material from one source, one reservoir to another. So we actually see this in many of the current planetary systems, protoplanetary disks that have been observed by many astronomers. So one of the um, uh, Atacama linear, I forget what ALMA stands for, but it's a big uh, uh, array of telescopes uh, that, has, uh, that has allowed us to detect many of these protoplanetary disks. And many of them show these gaps in their structures very similar to what may have been formation of say Jupiter or Saturn or other giant planets that may have opened up similar gaps and uh, put these reservoirs together. So it's not just a laboratory analysis, but given the technology that is available to us, we can actually extrapolate that and compare that with uh, um, exoplanets and other planetary systems that are forming and understand the history of our own solar system, as well as extrapolate that and try and infer things about other planetary systems that, that are still in the formation stage. Um, other really major discovery is meteorites from Mars. So these were called special group of meteorites that are called SNCs. Um, one of them is actually from India. It's a meteorite called Shargadi. It fell in Bihar, I forget what year, but uh, it's based on the local region there, Shargadi, where it's called Shargadi. So uh, these meteorites are very unique because as I said earlier, most of these meteorites formed four and a half billion years um, from now. So it's, they're, they're really ancient, but many of these SNC meteorites, they're actually much younger. Um, some of their ages are like 150 to 200 million years. So they're much, much younger. So we knew that they had to come from a planet that was large enough to sustain volcanism for that long in our solar system history. But one of the major um, evidence for that these meteorites are from Mars 
came from planetary exploration of Mars. So the mission Viking that went to the Mars and collected a bunch of meteor, a bunch of isotopic, sorry, bunch of um, analysis of Martian atmosphere. So when you compare these Martian atmospheric composition with the glasses that trapped, these volcanic glasses that trapped um, atmosphere of the planet of these meteorites, they sh actually show one-on-one -on -one match. So there are multiple um, gases that are shown here, CO2, nitrogen, argon, uh, krypton, and neon that show a very like distinct composition that matches with the Martian uh, atmosphere measured by Viking mission. And this was like a smoking gun or a very evident, uh, very strong evidence that these meteorites co are coming from Mars. So even before we can actually go to the planet and collect the samples, we already have some samples that tell you a lot about the igneous history of this planet. Um, I already spoke a little bit about calcium aluminum rich inclusions, which are the oldest solids. One of the important things about these inclusions are that they are predicted to, to have formed as the first form solids. What does that mean? So if you take a gas of solar composition and like completely evaporate it, thermodynamical calculations can tell you that the first solids to have condensed from that material are rich in calcium and aluminum. They're actually made of these minerals which are very unique. They're hibonite or corundum or melilite and spinel. So these mineral assemblages, is, the predicted mineral assemblages is, is what you can actually find in these CAIs. So that's another clue that they are the first form solids that condensed out of the gas. But the recent analysis, well, not so recent analysis of stardust material that collected uh, cometary particles from Comet Field 2 also showed these meteorites, uh, these, these materials containing these highly refractory CAI-like materials. Now, CAIs are to form very close to the sun, whereas comets come from like Kuiper Belt or much beyond um, the terrestrial planets. However, the existence of these materials that formed very close to the solar system, uh, to the sun, the early sun, and um, into these cometary bodies suggests that there was a very um, large scale transport of material in the early solar system. So that explains this transport. And here's an example of what that transport looked like. So you have a protosun, you have an early disk where you're still starting to form planets. However, this major transport of materials of sea and contours can actually take these things to the comet forming regions and preserve them there. And the last one that I want to talk about is formation, uh, the discovery of different organic materials in these meteorites. Some of them are really porous, delicate, a lot of these IDPs and uh, carbonaceous chondrites that contain organic materials. And um, they preserve um, a lot of the starting materials that may have caused uh, life on Earth. So that's where I'm going to stop. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. I can't hear you. I have a, a simple question. Yes. Uh, just to educate myself, I guess. Uh, okay. How do you determine the age of different kind of asteroid meteorites? Is it possible for beyond solar system thing? If you have the materials in your hand, like actual samples, yes, there are multiple uh, radio like radioactive isotopes. Radioactivity. Allow... Yes. Is it radioactivity methods or anything else? So far, radioactive radioactivity like uh, materials. So you have different chronometers like the short-lived chronometers, 26 aluminum, 53 manganese that decays to the, their daughter products and that can tell you the relative ages. You also have lead lead, uranium lead uh, system that can tell you about the ages too. Thank you, very nice talk. People will be benefited from the slides. Thank you.